Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. We're reporting in from The Hague in the Netherlands at the SDN NFV World Congress 2017 and I'm joined by two knowledgeable gentlemen, one I've known for quite a long time and one I've known for quite as long, but he's obviously and evidently as knowledgeable. Um, Charlie Ashton, our Director of Business Development at Windrow. Yep. Charlie, great to see you again. Good to see you, Martin. And Breen Madden, Director, Marketing Network Platforms Group at Intel. Breen, we've met a couple of times. We have. Welcome again. Thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Let's just do a bit of a riff on the industry as it is at the moment. Now let's make this too structured. Let's just have a talk. But I know because I know you both about talk. Um, what? Let's begin with you, Charlie. Look at looking at the event. It's five years now since the first NFV white paper was introduced. Um, the event is great. It's always good. It's always. I must say, I do like the event very much. But the focus shifts subtly or not so subtly year on year. What has the change of focus been this year compared to last year? You know, I think there's a continued focus on, on identifying which use cases can actually make money for the carriers, you know, in the near term. I mean, when we started this NFV journey, like you said, five years ago, it was really, a, it was a very general premise, right? In that we're going to virtualize services throughout the network, and that's going to result in I ideally new revenues as well as, uh, as uh, reduced operational expenses through automation. Um, I think what we've seen probably in the last year or so is a much greater focus on edge-related use cases. Um, you know, whether it's virtual CPE, multi-access, edge computing, virtual RAM, those kind of edge use cases. But I think what the carriers have figured out is, you know, they really offer the opportunity for, for near-term improvements in their business, near-term near up, near upside in the business. So I think that, that's really what we're seeing in terms, of, in terms of a use case focus this year as compared to last year. You know, people have sharpened in a bit on, on those kinds of applications. And what's the feeling like on the show floor uh, and in the sessions? Is it optimistic and positive? Yeah, I think it is. I think we're, the feeling is that we're moving now beyond the stage of endless pox and endless trials. And now we're actually talking about issues that relate to real deployment. You know, we're talking about automation, we're talking about orchestration, and we're talking about, you know, what does it actually take to get these systems out into the field running reliably and you know, meeting the carrier's customers' expectations in terms of the services they're delivering. Bring over to you. Um, every hype cycle has its downside. And uh, as we were talking off camera, you know, there has been a little bit of a dip into the trough of disillusionment as far as NFV is concerned anyway. There seems to be a general expectation that this would be a very swift process. And people seem to be surprised that five years on, things weren't, aren't as far advanced as some people thought they might be, mm -hmm. for various reasons. What they seem to be ignoring is that, as we all know from this industry, the general arc of a transformation is 10 years. Uh, 15 years sometimes in this industry, but 10 years. So I think it's reasonable to say perhaps we're halfway through the transformation. Would you agree with that? And do you think this trough of illusion, disillusionment is going to deepen or are we going to ride out the top of it? So, so I, I think playing on, on, on what Charlie said there, the, the atmosphere of this show this year is very, very positive. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot more um, conversations around can, uh, can do conversations um, as opposed to might do conversations. Um, if, if, you, if you look at the enterprise um, and data center business in general before, um, before uh, network transformed, it took about 10 years to cloudify and virtualize data centers, right? Yeah. Good things are not necessarily the easiest things to do. Um, and I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact of of why we're doing this, and the business opportunity that uh, NFE and SDN uh, promises. And it's not just a save money um, value proposition, it's also a make money value proposition. And we need to, as an industry, constantly focus on the fact that this is about technology transformation leading to business transformation, and to help the operators and the operator community change business models, find new services, and also, also be monetized, and monetize those services. Is there any evidence at all that that business transformation is now taking place alongside the network transformation? I, I, I think there is, and I think the conversations three years ago were development of POCs and development on technology proof points. I think as that process went forward, the operators felt, you know what, we need to figure out how we're actually going to transform to support these transformations as an, as an organization. People mentioned cloud native an awful lot of the show this, this yeah. year. 
But cloud native is, is an endpoint, and to get to cloud native, you do need to have the skill sets within your organization. You, you need to embrace the IT side of, 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 of the operator community that have the skill sets around things like um, uh, uh, you know, fail fast, et cetera, et cetera, to bring those skill sets into the network side of the business and learn from them. So I think there is most certainly a transformation from a business side. I also see as well the business models um, evolving uh, to a certain extent. Um, you know, every operator will say that average re revenue per user is, is declining. So they are very quickly needing to learn new ways of making money. And you know, a good example is in Orange where they, they spun up the MVNO called Libon, uh, where they saw that they were losing a certain demographic of subscribers. Yeah. And they, they said, well, let's, let's do something a little bit more different. Let's do something more business, with more business innovation. And they spun up the service. And what they actually learned from, from that, Martin, was not only could they attract subscribers back from within their region, they were getting subscribers, virtual subscribers from uh, the Philippines for instance, who are losing this service. So the models are certainly changing within the industry for sure. Charlie, do you see any changes in, in, in the business model in addition to what Bree's just been talking about? Anything, anything more evident happening or do you think it's slowly working its way through the system beneath it all? Well, I, I think the big change that the, that the operators are going through, it's not just the technology, right? It, it's all of the, it's the, it's the people underneath that. In fact, the, the, the mantra that we've heard over and over in, in keynote speeches this week is people, processes, and procurement. I mean, there are just massive system changes that the operators have to make so they can really get all the way through this journey. And I, but I think there's a strong recognition um, that that's happening. And you know, a lot of the carriers, they have actually very aggressive and very impressive programs you know, underway to make make those changes, I think there's a clear realization that that, that needs to be happening. And I certainly agree with what Brian said. I mean, the, the focus is very much on, you know, how do we make money and how do we not just, you know, reduce our operational costs? Obviously, we've got to do that as well. So another example that we're seeing a lot of interest in, as I mentioned earlier, multi-access edge computing. If you look at some of the applications that that enables, you know, things like smart stadiums, for example, that offers a, a lot of opportunities for, for service providers to make new kinds of revenue by attracting new kinds of subscribers with new services, and they can make revenue from the stadium owners as well as from the subscribers. So we, we, see, we see a lot of good examples that, that are going on. My, my background is in organizational psychology, part of it, psychology first, organizational psychology second. And when I was doing my degree, a lot of time was spent on, in, on the notion of teams within business, teams within sports, teams within the armed forces, and how they, how they function differently. And it strikes me that when you have a, a, a project for a set period of time, six months hard driving, years hard driving, you have a, a leadership and a, and a direction to go which is very positive, people can work to it. But if there is no sort of defined end goal in terms of this project is complete and we've done it, things tend to get a bit diffuse. And then if somebody gets disillusioned sufficiently, they leave and then the team can fall apart. And then they've got to start again. Do you think this is happening in some of the carriers? I think if, if, if I could you know, generalize it, I think number one, I think the most important team that we need to talk about is the ecosystem itself. The is industry the, sorry, is the ecosystem itself. Right. The industry. And if yeah. you look around the innovation that you're seeing at this show th th this year is test testament to the collaboration that's happening. So it's not only within the carriers. Um, that team effort requires the likes of Intel and Wind River and our our, our broad ecosystem of of, of, um, of partners to work as a team. And I think that's the first step and uh, keeping that momentum going. And you know you go through the storming forming. I think we're in that really strong forming phase and even before if, if you will. I think within carriers, there is, the skill sets are there. They're in both sides of, 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 um, of every carrier. And it's a question of saying, I have, I have a valuable skill set that I can use from my IT side of, of, of our business. I need that within my team. And I need you to come in and teach us. I need you to come in and learn. So there is definitely momentum in a lot of carriers around that, what I call skill set innovation, where people are relearning and retraining. And, and there's less of a, a, a view saying, well, my job has always been this, and therefore I'm not going to move on. They, yeah. they are open to the idea of, you know, it's time to move, it's time to retrain, it's trying to reskill. So certainly I think that there is a lot of storming and, and going on and you know maybe to the forming phase as well to really link in those specific skill sets that are needed within the new telco environment or the new network environment as, as, you, as you will. Charlie, so what's happening at Wind River in regard to all of this and overarching? What, what, are you, what are you focusing on? What are you hearing from the industry? We're very focused on end-to-end -end solutions rather than just providing, you know, or rather than 
rather than just ensuring that a single layer of the solution is, is optimal. Obviously, we provide a single layer of the solution. You know, we provide an NFVI software virtualization platform. But we recognize that even if we've got the best one on the planet, which we do, um, that's really not what the carriers care about, right? The carriers care about deploying end-to-end -end solutions that are going to enable them to meet their business goals and, and get rich. Um, so a lot of our focus, as Brian mentioned, has been on the complete end-to-end -end ecosystem. So we work with companies all the way from, you know, SDN controllers, um, orchestrators for orchestrating service deployment, the virtual network functions themselves, and the underlying hardware platforms that our, that our software then runs on. And we put a lot of focus not on, on not just on onboarding individual functions, but on looking at complete end-to-end -end use cases, putting together the service chains where necessary, so that the, the, there's a complete deployable solution that the service provider you know can pick up with the confidence that it's going to work and that their deployment schedule is going to be predictable because we've done so much of the heavy lifting up front. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question now. Um, given we're probably five years, we're halfway through this NFE trans mm -hmm. network transformation performance, um, what has surprised you individually? Ask you each in turn, what's been the biggest surprise you've experienced over this five year journey so far? Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent? I've been surprised by how long it took to move from a focus on pure standards to a focus on actual interoperability testing and plug fests. Um, I, I think there has been a shift now and the industry is much more focused on just getting stuff to work through plug fests. Um, but it took a long time to get there. I don't think that we really made that shift until probably the last year. Mm. I think we got very focused early on on proof of concepts that really, they verified some functionality, but they really didn't get you towards something that, that was deployable. And I think with, certainly with hindsight, a lot of folks in the industry probably realize, wish that we moved a lot quicker to you know, actual practical you know, deployments and platforms. I did a lot of demos and, and yeah. demonstrations of proof of concept yeah. and reported um, on it. And I must say, they did tend to get a bit samey after a while, and they tended not to move. It would yeah. been the same the next event as it was. The yeah, and you know, now we've moved to an attitude that says, okay, we're going to take three days in some beautiful city somewhere, we're going to get all these companies in a room together, and they're going to make stuff work. And then when they walk out of there, that's deployable by a carrier. And I think that probably that should have happened a little quicker. Reen, what about you? Um, the telecommunications industry is a very slow-turning industry, as we know. I, I think what surprised me the most is the willingness to collaborate um, between operators. Um, and you know, there's been a number of standards initiatives and industry uh, communities formed, like ONAP and, and OPNFV, for instance where seeing the collaboration between operators is, 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 is fundamental. And Charlie mentioned PlugFest. I think that the, the, uh, the willingness to adopt open source, open standards, has, 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 that momentum behind that has been really, really good. But we all know open source doesn't necessarily mean free. You know, <laughs> yeah. somebody, needs to take, somebody needs to take the, yeah. the code, if you will, um, and harden it and support it. And then I think the collaboration between the likes of Wind River and the open source community has been, has been a really valuable learning experience for everybody. And I think that, that needs to continue. And I think what surprises me the most is that maybe it hasn't gone even quicker because you see some of the operators that really, really are, are, are you know, at, that, at, the, at the forward facing role within the industry around open source and open standards and there needs to be more of that. And, and again, it's, it's about that level of collaboration across the industry to solve those problems. And the likes of OPNFE and ONAP are really good examples mm -hmm. of where people come together, they create a solution and a solution to solve a fundamental business problem. It could be automation, it could be orchestration, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we need and we need absolutely more of that. We've touched on this already, but I'd like to go to, into it in slightly greater depth before we finish. But again, five years in, um, NFE is now mainstream. People know what it means. They understand, not just in the acronym, they understand, they understand what it means in terms of, of the transformation of the network itself. And it's even become, being bandied about in, in national press and in the media. You know that something's on the move when that happens. But at the same time, there's always something to replace what has been going on. And so now we're hearing an enormous amount suddenly about, well, there's always been focused on automation, but we're hearing more about automation. We're hearing about AI, we're hearing about machine learning, cloudification always in the background as well, of course. Um, what do you think automation, machine learning, AI, etc., means in the context of network transformation? And how important are they going to be to the completion of that process? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start. And, you know, Charlie, please, please, um, please chime in. Um, from our perspective, it's the it's that f future 5G. I think that there's three key defined use cases within 5G of massive machine to machine, yep. enhanced mobile broadband, and yep. low latency read time. And those um, use cases are really driving um, the effort to um, to create, you know, really monetizable services. And the likes of AI is a very, very interesting uh, technology. Uh, because as we know, analytics is very important to operators. They need to understand the data, they need to understand where it is and, sure. and, and, and optimize it. And AI um, uh, as, a, as a service, if you will, on the edge of the network is going to be more prevalent in the 5G era because we need, um, we need solutions and services that are very, very dynamic. Uh, could self-provision even, but also as well understand where the uptime and downtime are at any one given time. And those services that are deployed at the edge, that need low latency also, you know, that data is valuable. So how do we monetize the data? How does the operators monetize the data? And, and having intelligence and our analytics to be able to understand that data is the first defined move for that. Um, and I think there's going to be a, a strong service de development around analytics, certainly at the edge, um, because of the massive amount of data that's going to be created by these 50 billion connected devices. And as, as Charlie mentioned earlier on, you know, the movement around the edge is going to be really critical for that. So I'm, I'm really excited. You know, it's, it's fantastic um, potential innovation coming up in the future. Johnny, oh, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, if you look at all the capabilities that 5G is going to bring to our industry in, in, in terms of enabling totally new kinds of applications that, that don't exist today, a lot of that is because the flexibility that it's going to bring to the networks in terms of network slicing and you know different kinds of QoS um, processes that are just changing dynamically. So it, it's really all about automation in order to make that happen efficiently and, hap and happen profitably, but in order to make that automation really be effective, it's got to be based on AI and it's got to be based on machine learning. You know, th there's no scope here for, for engineers to sit looking at dashboards and figuring out how to reconfigure, re reconfigure networks. Um, first of all, that doesn't scale, and secondly, it doesn't happen quickly enough. Yeah. So I think that the machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to be critical to the effective mm -hmm. use of automation yeah. so that carriers can really realize the business benefits mm -hmm. that, that 5G promises. And, and, and can I just add to that as well? Um, the, the analytics is also very important when you're looking at new services. In other words, um, in an industry like ours where it takes maybe 18 months validation of, of a cycle to validate a service, analytics gives operators the ability to make very, very quick risk-based decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's bringing that fail-fast mentality in. But they need to bake, uh, bake that risk analysis on data, on analyzed data. So analytics coming from the subscriber base and from the enterprise services is going to help them predict what type of services they need and when, which is when you couple that with the 5G future, it creates a very powerful business model for operators. Indeed, we're out of time, gentlemen. We're going to talk on, but fascinating stuff. Thank you both very much indeed. Charlie Ashton, Green Madden, thanks a lot. Thanks, Martin. Thank you.